Welcome back. We are on to week four and we're covering causation. So typically when you talk about causation, you go back to Hume, right? That's sort of where the uh, conversation starts. <clears throat> and it's actually the exact same Hume reading where we talked about laws of nature is also uh, used to talk about Hume's concept of causation. Because um, as we'll see, they're sort of intertwined. So rather than read that paper again, um, I wanted to cover Helen Beebe's article, which uh, does a bit of a textual analysis of Hume. So, <clears throat> as I said, right, same reading. So the, the reason I, I decided to do a Beebe's sort of an analysis of Hume is that this might be a kind of paper that some of you might want to write. Uh, of philosophy is, is an area that a lot of people study, particularly in our department. So if you're interested in sort of interpreting Hume and, and, and grappling with some of the puzzling aspects of Hume and trying to solve some of these problems for Hume, uh, you could write a paper, you could write a paper responding to Beebe saying her you know, analysis is, uh, has a problem or maybe you, know, you agree with her analysis and here's a way to extend it um, to deal with some other problems. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, that's why I'm using this paper. It, it's a kind of philosophy that we haven't done yet that you might wanna do. Uh, so, in short, right, the same sort of skeptical approach that Hume took towards the laws of nature, the fact that all we ever observe, remember he's an empiricist, right, so all of our concepts need to be grounded in something, of some observable phenomenon in the world. He says, well, um, all we observe are regularities, right, um, so we don't see any necessitation that these laws of nature are supposedly doing, and similar thing with causation, right, we say, for Hume, it seems, uh, what it is for X to cause Y, right, is just that we seem to regularly observe X as preceding Y's. What else could we observe, right? We don't observe the cause as some other thing. Um, but we're going to see a little more careful analysis of Hume's writings because he says a lot of different things that don't always seem compatible with each other. And so her task is sort of like trying to unify what Hume says in a coherent whole that also kind of makes sense, you know, with in the real world, it might actually be true. We saw Hume talking about necessary connection. Uh, just a reminder, right? This is not the same kind of necessity that you might use in like modal logic. So we say that you know mathematical propositions are necessarily true, and what, when we say necessity in that area, we mean it's true in every possible world, right? Um, but the sort of necessity we've been talking about when we talked about laws of nature in this class is a a more uh, narrow kind of necessity. It doesn't apply to every world, just to our world, our universe. So in our universe, the gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram to the negative one. Um, but we could imagine a universe where the gravitational constant is different. Uh, might be a very chaotic universe, right? Because the planets and matter might behave very differently and then you might not end up with life or whatever, but we can imagine that universe. Um, and we can imagine it without a contradiction, right? Whereas um, if you're trying to imagine a universe where two plus two equals five or where there are square circles, uh, that's just contradictory and, and some would say inconceivable. <clears throat> so for Hume, when he talks about necessary connection, it's just ne necessity relative to this universe. And in this universe, if I drop a heavy object near the surface of the earth and nothing gets in the way to catch it or a strong wind doesn't blow it or something, it's always, always going to fall to the earth. It's that kind of necessity, right? It's always going to fall the universe. But so this is weaker than, you know, mathematical necessity, but it's a, still a very strong claim, a very strong relation. Um, and Hume, being the skeptic, is doubtful. First of all, whether any anything, any relation that strong actually exists in nature, or at the very least, whether we could ever know it or have access to it. All we ever experience are regularities, right? So we do notice that every time I drop something, it falls to the earth, right? Um, but certainly I don't observe every single thing ever being dropped towards the earth, and nothing about those individual episodes tells me that it has to always happen that way. It seems easily conceivable, then the next time I drop an object, it could fly up, right? 
Um, <clears throat> so nothing in what we observe seems to suggest any necessary connection. Um, so one of the options is we're adding it, right? Um, we're, all we're seeing is regularities, and then humans, just due to the way our psychology works, we want to then add, sort of say, oh, this is necessary, or there's a causal interaction here. And so <clears throat> Bibi's going to explore a couple of different interpretations of what could be going on. Is it just pure regularity, and that's all there is? And if you think there's necessary connection, you're just wrong? Or is there a kind of necessary connection, but it's a psychological thing we're adding? Um, it's not entirely clear what you mean. So we're going to sort of see, follow each interpretation down to its sort of logical conclusion and see if one's better than the other. So back to the, the text, you, you may recall uh, that Hume divided his reasoning, he divided reasoning, human reasoning, into two subject matters. Right? Um, you could be reasoning about relations of ideas, that's mathematics and logic. Or you could be reasoning about matters of fact, you know, tables and chairs and bread and rocks falling towards the earth. So Hume says all reasoning about matters of fact is just reasoning about causal relations. Right? If I'm thinking about, you know, why things fall to the earth, I'm thinking about causation. <clears throat> now his example is bread here. So if I'm thinking about matters of fact and about the nature of bread and what it does to my body, right, and I construct a general rule that eating bread will nourish me rather than poison me. Um, that general statement, I make that claim because I'm positing a causal relation between bread and my body. Bread has a certain kind of body. It's a good one, right? Nourishing one. And as we've seen, since for him, all ideas must originate in sensory impressions. If I'm going to understand reasoning about matters of fact, that means I need to be looking for the original sensory impressions of causation. Right. I have that concept. It seems to be something I use when I reason about matters of fact. Then where is the causation? Where do I see it? Where does that concept come from? Or if I don't see causation directly, what other things do I see right, that I can then construct into the idea of causation? But Hume does say we can have more complex ideas that are built out of more basic sensory impression. It's possible that causation is one of those. So he sort of begins to analyze our idea of causation, right? Maybe it's made up of more basic parts, which our um, perception can be perceived. And he says, well, at the very least, right, our, our, idea, our idea of causation includes the ideas of contiguity, right, being next to, and priority, temporal order, right? So causes are near their effects in both time and space. They are before their effects, and they have to be somewhere near them, right? <clears throat> um, those are two things that are totally perceivable, right, that are part of our concept of causation. Um, but he thinks, he seems to say, right, that for humans, we, we have a third ingredient in our concept of causation, right? I mean, because lots of things are contiguous in time and space, but we don't say that they're causing each other, right? So um, I might happen to burp. And then you might happen to sneeze a little bit later and we might be near each other, but typically we wouldn't say that my sneeze or my sneeze caused your burp, right? Is that, how did I do it? Yeah, <laughs> right. You can imagine all kinds of things that happen near each other in time and space, but they're not always causally related, right? That's, um, that's not sufficient causation, even on our everyday concept of it. So what is that extra thing? And the extra thing, he says, is this notion of necessary connection, right? So if X is cause Y's, then that means that any time an X occurs, it'll produce Y. Okay, so if that's true, if that's his analysis of our everyday concept of causation is correct, that it involves contiguity, priority, and necessary connection, um, again, it's easy to find the first two, right? We see contiguity and, and temporal priority all the time. But the question is, where do we get this concept of necessary connection? And he doesn't see it in the world, right? And we've sort of been through that when we talk about laws of nature. He says, well, if it's not in the world, then it must be added by our minds, right? So we must sort of develop a habit of inferring Ys from Xs if we see them happen regularly. So, for example, if it was a regular thing that every time one person burped, another person sneezed, and we saw that all the time, right? Then we would sort of add that this is 
necessary connection here. And we would say there's a causal relation between one person sneezing and one person burping. Um, as it happens that those two coincide fairly rarely, right? So once we see things right <clears throat> close to each other in space and time over and over and over, our minds say these are necessarily connected. Right? Okay, so <clears throat> that might seem sort of straightforward, but you, the more you think about it, it's it's not clear that it's that simple. Um, so first of all, you might ask, well, why does Hume claim that we never observe anything in the world besides contiguity and succession? That's plausible at first, but um, let's be careful with this, right? And second, um, if he's right that the necessary connection is added by our own minds, how are we so dumb sort of that we would mis mistake something that's happening in our own minds for something that's happening in the world, right? If we think that if our everyday idea of causation is, is a phenomenon in the world, but we've actually just been importing the necessary connection, that third part, from our own brains, how are we that deluded, right? Um, maybe we're just, maybe humans are just that dumb, but um, not obvious. Usually I don't, it's pretty rare that I mistake something in my mind for something in the world, right? We elucid, there's illusions and hallucinations, but relatively rare, this seems to be a very sort of like regular sort of thing. So <clears throat> answering the first question, right, what, why does Hume claim that we never see necessary connection in the world? In part, he appeals to the ph phenomenology, right? So he says, well, you know, describe what you see when you see two billiard, a billiard ball hit another and then it rolls away. Well, I see a ball roll, I see it touch another ball, I see the other ball roll. He says, that's all I see. That's what my visual phenomenology is of. I don't have a visual experience. Um, so <clears throat> some people might say, no, I kind of do see that, that the ball would have to roll away, or at least that's my phenomenology, right? It would seem very weird if the ball hit the other one and it just stopped, right? I would think something was wrong or the, the ball was glued to the table. So maybe there is a sense in which my phenomenology is also includes necessary connection. Um, and Hume says no, right? And you may recall he, he, he used the example of like, if I had never seen, say, bread before, um, I wouldn't know a priori that it would be nourishing. For all I know, it's poisonous. For all I know, it's not even digestible. I just see this brown lump. I would, I would never infer the necessary connection, right? That seems to indicate that it's not there in the visual phenomenology, it's something that we add after we've experienced bread a bunch of time. Um, that's one interpretation. Another subtly different interpretation is that I don't observe the necessary connection. So these claims are very close and kind of related, but they are different. One says, when I see bread, nothing about that appearance licenses an additional inference to what that bread is, right? And the second claim is, when I see bread, I don't see any necessary connection, whatever that might look like. Um, the main difference is the first one would only apply to you know any given visual experience of bread. Um, and the second would seem to apply to all breads, right? Um, Evie says she's kind of, Hume establishes one, right? That yeah, it's true. We don't have any a priori sort of impression of the causal powers of some object if we've never seen it before. Um, but she thinks that two might be controversial. Um, and I won't get into the details more. It's not, I, Hume seems fairly plausible on this point, but um, Evie's kind of, hashing out very uh, strict sort of logical and strict logical terms. Okay, so the other thing that might be going on, right, what Hume might be saying is that we regularly mistake an impression of an inference happening in our own minds for something in the world, right? So I regularly see billiard balls behave a certain way when they hit each other and after seeing it enough times, I just start to infer what's going to happen to the next billiard ball, and then it becomes such a habit that I mis kind of mistake it, and I think that the, the inference that's going on in my head is actually going on in the world. Um, Hume sort of considers right this sort of objection, right? Like, like the objection is how could how could we be that dumb? How how could we possibly mistake something in our heads for the real world? And Hume sort of a, considers a form of that objection might find it absurd because it seems obvious that 
thought relies on causation, but not the other way around, right? Ca thought doesn't invent causation. Thought is involved in causal relations itself. Um, and Hume simply says, well, it might seem absurd to you, but that's not really an argument, right? You, yeah, that sounds absurd, right? So he says, I'm asking you to really sort of like reorient your mind, right? And you've kind of been blinded, right? So someone who's never seen color before might take certain claims about color to be absurd, right? Um, he says, you're just so used to your mind sort of spreading itself out on the external world that it takes you a minute to understand what I'm saying and accept that yeah, you're just making mistakes all the time, and there is no causation, even mental causation, right? It's it's all sort of added. Okay, so <clears throat> once we sort of develop this habit of thinking about nourishment automatically when we see bread, having you know repeatedly eaten bread and found it nourishing, um, we tend on this interpretation we tend to mistake that for a deductive inference, um, and we think that. Looking back, we think, oh, yeah, I, the first time I saw bread, I could have deduced that it was nourishing. But Hume would say, no, we're just confusing two types of inference, right? An inductive from an inductive. So this is one interpretation of what Hume is saying. Call that the projectivist interpretation, projecting from our minds on. Um, we could contrast that with the regularity interpretation of Hume, which is the claim that all, this, all causation is is constant conjunction, right? Contiguity and, and temporal priority. And there's no third element. Right? Um, so the key difference between the projection version and the regularity version is, is this third element of necessary connection, is it really part of our concept of con causation? Or um, is it just an error theory right? where you no, know, all causation really is, or all the concept really should be is, is close in space and time and we should get rid of should we get rid of this third element or is Hume saying that this is sort of an essential part of our concept right. okay. so the, the regularity version would be something like this um, it, well here's a way to make sense of the regularity version right um, so so far our analysis has characterized our co concept of causation is Contiguity and succession plus necessary connection, which is added by the mind. Um, and on the regularity theory, we should just get rid of the third thing, get rid of the necessary connection, right? and just say the causation is just the two, contiguity and succession. So maybe he's being revisionary, right? He's trying to revise our concept of causation, get rid of the necessary connection part, and say you're you're all mistaken. Let's get let's get right on it. And there are some passages where that seems to be supported. He does sometimes seem to define cause in terms of contiguity and succession and not mention necessary connection at all. Um, but there are other passages that seem to contradict that, so I'm not going to, if you want to write your paper and get into the weeds, pulling out some of the quotes from Hume to support your interpretation, feel free. Um, all that detail. So there's another author, Garrett, who sort of tries to make sense of this regularity approach. So his interpretation uses Hume's notion of abstract ideas. So when we see a tree, um, we form an impression of that particular tree, and that's our idea of the tree. Um, just a single sort of snapshot of a tree in, in our minds. But then if you want the more general concept tree, not of just any particular tree, um, we need a more abstract idea, right? Not just a single tree. And so abstract idea of a tree will be that impression, right, that one particular example of a tree, but then it will tend to recall other particular tree impressions. So this group of impressions of various trees that seeing any given tree will sort of revive, um, Garrett, this writer calls the revival set of, so, you know, maybe your tree concept is a particular oak, right? Um, but when you think about trees, Right, the whole revival set will also include some impressions of maple and so on. Right, this is all the whole reason for this interpretation of concepts, which may seem a little weird, is again, Hume thinks that your concept is just based on a sensory impression. Any sensory impression will be of any one particular tree. Right, I'm trying to make sense of how you could think of trees more generally when your mind is just populated by impressions of particular how they. 
So on this interpretation, the, re the revival set of the abstract idea of causation will be a set of pairs of events in a causal relation, right? All the different things, billiard balls you've seen, all the bread that you've eaten, all the things, that, examples of causation that you encounter. And since all you see, right, is contiguity and succession, um, be a set of things close to each other in space and time. Where does the necessary connection come in? Well, here Garrett tries to sort of um, synthesize sort of these, these different interpretations of Hume and says, well, for some people, um, there's going to be a third part right, that also relates pairs of events um, in, as to being connected necessarily, right? And that part, that third part, will have been added by their minds, but we do it all the time, right? We see so. <clears throat> You know, a given impression of a causal event will be a one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball, and then my mental projection onto it, and that set of three becomes part of like a revival set for causation. But in in either case, the pairs are the same, so the pairs are the revival set. And so, if I'm if I've read Hume and I'm a little smarter, and I don't think there's any necessary, I can have the same concept of causation as someone else, right? Because I still have the same pairs of events revived as, as my concept, right? So I've we've all seen the same billiard balls. And when I say cause, me and the person who hasn't read Hume both recall the same pairs of balls, of billiard balls, right? Um, they have an extra thing, right? And I don't, they have this extra necessary connection thing and I don't, but it doesn't matter. We can still have the same concept because we have the same sets of pairs. The other part, the necessary connection part, is unnecessary, but you, it still qualifies as a causation concept. Um, does this work? I mean, Beebe's a little skeptical that this would work. Um, you know, is that what our concept of causation really is? That all it is is just a set of all the pairs of events we've seen related in contiguity and succession. Um, doesn't the nature of the relation? between the members of the pairs matter, right? I mean, re recall the burp and the sneeze, right? Would, would those pairs be in there? Because um, that's not a causal relation. And also sort of like the whole idea of a concept just being a set of objects is, is problematic, which as we've seen before in Quine, right? So creature with a heart and creature with a kidney picked out the exact same set of objects because it just so happens that everything with a heart has a kidney, um, but it's not the same concept, right? Having a heart is a totally different concept. Uh, and anyways, it's interpretation is going way beyond Hume. It's really hard to say if this is what he means. You know what I mean? But Garrett's just trying to sort of make sense of it. So that's interpretation of Hume as, as regularity theorist, causation. Um, that the basic concept is just right pairs pairs of uh, objects in relation of contiguity and succession. Some people add a third thing, but that doesn't really matter, right? Mess up the concept. Here's another possibility. Hume is a projectivist. He's saying, no, it's essential to our concept of causation that we add this necessary connection thing from our minds, right? Even though it doesn't exist in the world, we don't always know that it's our mind adding it, right? They just seem to look to us like causation is involved. Um, and so BB uses this analogy to aesthetic qualities that she thinks Hume, or Hume talks about it, right? So, like causation, when we talk about, when we look at a painting and say that's beautiful, um, Hume says, well, the beauty isn't something we see, right? We just see paint. Um, the beauty is something we add from our minds, right? Um, but we can still talk objectively about beauty because people will tend to agree on certain standards, right? An expert in archaeology or an expert in art will often agree on what counts as beautiful and what doesn't. Right? So even though beauty is technically a subject, subjective thing, it's added by the mind, it can still, claims about beauty can be true or false, right? They're not completely in the eye of the beholder. There's some sort of objectivity. Um, and so BB's saying maybe we can use similar standards for causation. So um, science, in, any of you in the sciences know, we have methods for determining whether a relationship is a causal one, right? We certain types of experiments that we do and certain statistical analyses. And we'll say, yes, here's a causal relation. Here's not a causal relation. Those methods are objective and agreed upon, right? 
And so long as a relation meets that standard, then we can say, yes, it's true. There's a causal relation. No, there is not. Even if we never actually see the causation and all the causation is added by our own minds, um, it could still be true or false and claims about causation can still be true. So again, you know, BB here is going sort of fairly far beyond what Hume ever actually said, but the reason she does that is because it's a way to make some of Hume's important claims compatible with each other, which is that, number one, he seems to, in a lot of places, say necessary connection is part of our concept of causation. Two, causal claims are true fact. You can say that it's true or false that X causes Y. It's not just totally subjective. And then three, meaning empiricism, right? That concepts in order to have meaning must be grounded in sensory impression. So we've been having a hard time reconciling those three claims um, and interpretation. Now, there are other passages in Hume that suggest another sort of interpretation. Like sometimes it sounds like he's saying causal powers might actually be out there in the world. We just have no access to them. That would be a skeptical realist position. Realist saying, yeah, necessary connection does exist in the world. We just can't ever know about it, um, which is the skeptical. Um, that's another interpretation that's out there. It would seem to sacrifice his meaning in empiricism. It would seem to say we have a concept of causation, even though we can never know anything of it. So um, BB thinks or other her projectivist interpretation is the best because it, it keeps those three essential things that Hume wants to believe in. Uh, in his analysis of causation, write a paper favoring the skeptical realist position, if you like, you know. Um, okay, well, that's plenty of time on Hume. Uh, see you next time.